Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. So Adam, we did an episode a few months back now on a technology called Windows Hello for Business, which is a passwordless way to authenticate to your Windows machine. We talked about many different methods of deployment for hybrid deployments, and we'll just focus on talking about hybrid deployments for a minute. There were two ways to deploy it. One was called key trust and one was called certificate trust. There's also that for on-prem organizations if you were like fully on-prem, but most orgs today are at least in some sort of hybrid format. As well as there was something called key trust. Now, key trust up until this point was only for Azure AD joined devices. And we talked about how easy and trivial it was to deploy Windows Hello for Business on an Azure AD joined device. We talked about where for Windows Hello for Business on hybrid models, you had to deploy a PKI infrastructure for security-based uh, or sec- security certificate trust scenarios. And then for key trust scenarios, you had to have enough 2016 domain controllers to handle all those authentications because what you were doing was entrusting the key to your domain controller instead of with that certificate. What has changed? Well, there is now cloud trust with hybrid domains and hybrid Azure AD joined devices. That is big news because what it does is it completely simplifies the deployment of Windows Hello for Business as well as the ability to single sign on with passwordless security keys. Now, prior to this, FIDO2 keys were available with Windows Hello for Business on hybrid Azure AD joined devices. But if you look at the documentation on how to do that, it was not a trivial exercise. It was a major deployment. It's pretty complex in my opinion. I haven't even done that walkthrough for my lab environment. But what this does is it makes it pretty much trivial to deploy passwordless security keys for Windows Hello for Business. And why is that important? It's important because we talked about the executive order or statement from the government on fish resistant MFA and how a lot of organizations are starting to have to comply with fish resistant MFA methods and phishing resistant means that you just can't get that MFA token or that MFA challenge from somebody, right? Because if you have the FIDO2 key in your hand, like you can't fish me. I can't give that to you even if, well, if I wanted to. And so this is something that a lot of organizations, I know for me, I've talked to a lot of customers about it. A lot of manufacturing customers that do business with the DOD, they're trying to pass like say CMMC or some other certification or to be compliant with these new standards. And they're looking into phishing resistant MFA. And so this is big news for those customers. So we're going to talk about that and some of the pain points that it alleviates from the traditional method of how to do Windows Hello for Business for hybrid models. And for those of us who, you know, maybe you don't remember or haven't deployed Windows Hello for Business um, or or just don't have time to go back and review the first episode, I'll just give you kind of the the 60 second version on what is Windows Hello for Business. So Andy kind of already gave you the high points that it's a phishing resistant multi-factor authentication, which is passwordless. So under the covers, Windows Low for Business, if you remember our episode from a week ago when we talked about password cracking, we talked about the concept of you put in a password, it goes through a hashing algorithm, and then that hash is transmitted across the network 
So there's the potential for that to be intercepted. And then it's compared against a hash that is a shared secret, essentially, on a server. So the server says, yes, that hash the client sent me matches the hash I have stored in my database. You're good. You can get in. Comparatively, Windows Hello for Business doesn't work that way at all. What is transmitted over the network is totally different. So I'm going to kind of abstract away the different deployment models for a second before we get back into it and talk about cloud trust. So we're not we're not really focused on any specific deployment model here. But at its core, it's based on public and private key cryptography, where which is this concept that I have a private key that is unique to me that only I possess. I'm the only one who possesses it. And then a server may possess a public key. One or more servers can possess that public key. And it can validate that something signed with my private key could have only come from me. You know, cryptographically, we know that's Andy Jaws' private key. Only he, as long as he possesses it, could have signed this and it could have only come from him. So when I sign in through Windows Hello for Business, by the way, something a lot of people think that's not actually true is that Windows Hello for Business requires biometric authentication, like the camera on Surface devices or other PCs, or like a fingerprint reader. Um, that does facial recognition or fingerprint recognition or whatever. That is not a requirement for Windows Slow for Business. It does not require biometric authentication at all. So the other deployment methodology is a PIN. And a PIN is different conceptually than a password, and we'll talk about why in just a second. So either I use my biometric or I use my PIN, and that unlocks the TPM on my device, my trusted platform module, essentially a secure enclave for secrets, unlocks that private key, and it uses that private key then to sign a proof, a time-bound proof. And so this proof only lasts and only is valid for a very short period of time, and it contains that proof again, like we'll say Andy signed this. And that proof is what's transmitted across the network. Now an attacker can intercept that all they want, but A, it expires in a very short period of time, and B, it, it's, it's a proof. It's not something I can use over and over again. And so when that lands at the remote server, it compares that and uses the, the public key to validate that this could have only come from Andy, that it is still valid. It's within the time expiration that is allowed for that proof. And if that all lines up, it says, yep, Andy, you can sign in. So I've not, the, the server doesn't have that secret. You know, it doesn't have that private key on its end. There is nothing to steal essentially over the network because that proof is worthless after a very short period of time. Now, why that pin on the device is different than a password is because again, it's not transmitted. It's local to that device. That pin is only valid on that device with that combination of trusted platform module or TPM. And so in this way, the pin does not need all of the complexity of a password because there isn't something a remote um, server has stored. It's not something an attacker could steal and then attempt to crack. And in fact, on that device, if the attacker stole that, literally that specific laptop, TPM implements anti-hammering at a silicon level. So it ensures that only so many attempts are valid against it before it locks out. You can only try so many pins before it says, nope, you've had too many guesses. Why don't you go take a take a lap and come back? And so in that way, the pin just doesn't need the same level of complexity. In fact, I'll tell you at Microsoft, our pins are six-digit numeric because they just they don't need to be more complex than that. They're the only way an attacker could try to break into this is if they stole my surface. And again, A, you have to steal it from me, and B, you have to guess, you know, something that has um you know, hundreds of thousands of potential combinations, uh, I guess a million, um, with anti-hammering that only gives you, you know, six or seven tries before it locks out. So good luck with that, you know, kind of thing. So anyhow, that's that's Windows Hello for Business in a nutshell. Again, does not require biometric authentication, can also be used with a PIN, and really involves public private key cryptography, um, signing a proof, and then transmitting that to a remote server. Now, as far as the implementation details, that's what we're getting into today a little bit more. Uh, we mentioned the the previous implementation models like certificate trust and key trust, and now back to your regularly scheduled programming on cloud trust, Andy. <laughs> 
So important to note that this deployment model for Cloud Trust can be used for new implementations of Windows Hello for Business, as well as existing deployments can move to this new model using some policy control. Windows Hello for Business uses something called Azure AD Kerberos to basically alleviate a lot of the pain points that IT professionals have had over the years trying to deploy Windows Hello for Business in a hybrid model. So it doesn't require any deployment of any public key infrastructure. So PKI is not required and it doesn't require any changes to your existing PKI if you have it. And CloudTrust doesn't require the syncing of any public keys between Azure AD and the on-premise domain controllers like the key trust and the certificate trust did. And so that means there used to be a, a little bit of a delay between user provisioning and the ability to authenticate because there was that syncing of public keys, uh, usually between your Azure AD sync time. So it could take up to like an hour or so before a user is able to authenticate using Windows Hello for Business on that machine after it's been provisioned, meaning that after they signed in and, and gotten it going. And again, we talked about security keys. The deployment of security keys with the old way of doing it with certificate trust and key trust, it was not trivial. It was pretty difficult. But this enables you to do passwordless security keys with very minimal extra setup, which is, again, that new phishing-resistant authentication method that a lot of companies are going for. Cloud Trust has one thing that I'll note is if you do need certificate based authentication, like if you're using like cat cards or something like that, or um, smart cards and you're using certificate based authentication, it does not support that currently. So if that's a requirement of your authentication, then Cloud Trust may not be the model for you. There's also a couple other unsupported scenarios we'll talk about later, but it's just important right off the bat, if you're using certificate based authentication, you know, go with cert trust then because you're obviously using certificates and have a PKI. On a related note, by the way, and something we can talk about at a future show, uh, certificate based authentication for Azure AD did just launch recently in public preview. And that is a long awaited capability for organizations that need to use certificate authentication certificate based authentication like CAC PIV um, and didn't want to run ADFS anymore because who, who could blame you who wants to run ADFS anymore and and now you can run those natively with cloud-based authentication to Azure AD not what we're talking about today a different thing but related and something if that's of interest to your org you may want to check out so again cloud trust uses Azure AD Kerberos and so when you enable Azure AD Kerberos, a Kerberos object is created within your on-premise AD. The object will appear as something called a read-only domain controller object, and it isn't associated with any physical servers. Key trust and certificate trust, they use certificate authentication based Kerberos for requesting those Kerberos ticket granting tickets or TGTs for on-premise authentication. And so what happens is those public keys typically were synced with Azure AD and Azure AD is just there to pass on the authentication to the on-premise environment where the TGT and the actual authentication happen in the old way of doing it. If you're using Azure AD Kerberos in this new Cloud Trust method, Azure AD Kerberos actually does the TGT exchange for you using this read-only domain controller object. Another thing that is important to note is there were some PKI requirements for accessing on-premise resources from Azure AD joined devices. So even if you were in a cloud trust key deployment model for Azure AD joined devices, which again is very trivial, it's just enabling it in an Intune policy, it's very easy to deploy for Azure AD joined devices, you had to have certificates along with a certificate revocation list or CRL published so that you could have single sign-on to those on-premise resources. 
because of how Windows works. When you sign in with a password, that password and username are passed on to an on-premise resource. Now, on a domain joined machine, usually you're signing in with a password, and so that's just passed right through to whatever server or resource you're trying to access. But if you deploy Windows Hello for Business on an Azure AD joined device, you're not signing in with your password initially. And so when you try to access a on-prem resource, it will prompt you the very first time for that username and password because you actually haven't given it to Windows. And so there was this whole thing that you had to do to get the CRL stood up, the PKI to enable SSO and all this other stuff to on-premise resources. Well, guess what? All that goes away because you have this Azure AD Kerberos object and that does the SSO for you. So there is still benefit in walking through some of this, even if you have Cloud Trust for Azure AD join devices, if the, one of your org requirements is to get single sign-on to on-prem resources. Which, to be fair, I, I think for most organizations is one of the concerns about moving to that device identity model where it's Azure AD joined, it's cloud joined, it's that cloud native kind of model. They say, well, we still might have this on-premises need or that on-premises need. And in the past, that has been possible to do that SSO. But to your point, Andy, there was this laundry list of features involving CRLs and everything else. And now this is, this is just a much simpler deployment method. So although the majority of the benefit here is for hybrid Azure AD joined devices, which are still at their core on-premises domain joined devices. Even for your cloud joined devices, there are benefits here to moving to this deployment model and getting it stood up in your environment. They will see that seamless single sign-on experience to those on-prem resources like file shares, printers, um, on-premises web apps that use like IWA and stuff like that. So um, just a lot of benefit all the way around. So we talked about some unported, unsupported scenarios. And one of them was... You know, if you're looking for certificate-based authentication, this is not going to be the model deployment for you. As well as if you are one of those companies that is still all on-prem, and I mean no, no presence in the cloud. If you're using Exchange on-prem and SharePoint on-prem and, and you have zero presence, not even Office 365, then you can't use this cloud trust, obviously, because it does require syncing to the cloud as well as it doesn't support RDP and VDI scenarios for Windows Hello for Business. Those require certificate based uh, certificate trust. And so smart card authentication essentially. And finally, there is one limitation, which is in the hybrid model. If you're using hybrid Azure AD join devices, we have talked about device identity in the past where that is a domain join machine. And so the very first time that you log in and provision that machine with Windows Hello for Business, even in this model, it has to have line of sight to the domain controller. So if it's a remote employee and you deploy this model, it still needs to have line of sight somehow that very first time they sign in and provision Windows Hello for Business. After that, however, you do not need line of sight to the DC. So that's important to know after the very first time the authentication happens purely within Azure and that Azure AD Kerberos object. So let's talk about deployment really quick at a high level. It's pretty simple and we'll put the documentation in the show notes so you guys can review it. If this is something of interest to you, the first thing you got to do is deploy this Azure AD Kerberos. Now, if you've previously deployed Windows Hello for Business and you're using it now and you've deployed the on-premise SSO using security keys, which was that laundry list of things that you had to do, you already have that Azure AD Kerberos object. So you can skip this part if you've already done that part. Now, if you haven't done any of that, then you'll need to deploy the object. And that is just a series of PowerShell uh, commands you have to install the AD Azure AD Kerberos module using a PowerShell command and then just running a few PowerShell commands and linking it up to your Azure AD tenant. So not a whole ton there. 
some documentation to read over, make sure that you have it all correct and understand it, and then just running it and putting that object within your AD domain. After that, it's just configuring the policy. So you can deploy it two different ways, through GPO or through an Intune configuration profile. Now, if you're doing it through GPO, then you might want to update your ADMX or ADML files for your Windows 10 21H2 or Windows 11 group policy settings. So that's important to know too. This will only work on 21H2, Windows 10, or Windows 11 and higher. This feature is not available for older versions of Windows 10. So make sure that you have those versions of Windows 10 or 11. And then, you know, if you're behind on your ADMX configuration settings, you'll want to go and grab the latest ones because there's a new setting in there that when you enable the Windows Hello for Business, it has a selection for use cloud trust. If you're in a co-management or Intune managed state, you want to create a configuration policy for Windows Hello for Business, and then you'll have to use a custom OMA URI profile to push through a essentially a registry key, right? To configure the Cloud Trust method for Windows Hello for Business. And that's pretty much it. Then you can test out your users, right? So have a user log in, they get provisioned. It should prompt them right away to create a pin. You need to have MFA enabled and it'll prompt for MFA and then the provisioning starts. And just remember that first provision has to have line of sight to the domain controller. So all in all, a very, very simplified deployment method requires no PKI infrastructure. Deployment of this AD Kerberos object just a few PowerShell scripts and then configuring the GPO and or and or the Intune policy for co-managed situations. So very, very um, huge improvements on getting a passwordless method. And I'll tell you from experience, number one, Windows Hello for Business is a more secure method of authenticating to your PC because it satisfies an MFA requirement because your pin or your face is something you know or something you are. And then the machine, because that pin or biometric is local to that machine, it is something you have. So technically it is multi-factored and it's a better user experience. I have never deployed Windows Hello for Business in an environment at an organization where someone was like, oh, I'd rather enter in my eight to 10 character password that you require that's super complex. No like putting in a pin or being able to sign in with your face, users love that. And in fact, most users expect it these days because it's in our smartphones. It's something that they do daily. So highly recommend that you look at this new deployment model if you haven't deployed Windows Hello for Business before. And even if you have, regardless of your deployment method previously, it is something to look at with this new cloud trust. I don't know what else to add to that. That is a pretty great summary of why you should care and why you want it. The only other thought I have to pile on here is coming from the world of IT, I know how hard it is to bring multiple groups together. And I certainly know that some of the crustiest dudes or gals <laughs> in any IT environment are like your old school Windows server infrastructure types and getting them to do anything requires a congressional act. And so the less you need their involvement to do something you want to do for like the endpoints or for security, the more likely you are to succeed. And so essentially what this has done is reduce the amount of effort you need from other stakeholders to move your endpoint security forward. And that is a win. I know for a lot of IT people, that really, really, really helps. And again, we've been kind of we're big fans of Windows Low for Business on this show. We're big fans of passwordless on this show. Passwords must die. And the way we get rid of passwords is we start having credible alternatives. And from there, we can go down that path of eventually moving all the way to getting rid of passwords entirely. In fact, um, you know, people are always like, well, what's the point of having password this if I can still sign in with my password? And it's, well, we have to have the alternative first before we can get rid of the other thing, right? And the very first service that now offers uh, the ability to get rid of passwords entirely from Microsoft is consumer Microsoft accounts. So it is actually possible now on your consumer Microsoft account, like you use for 
Xbox or Skype or Teams consumer or for your uh, M365 family account, you can actually go on now to your security settings for that account and you can say, remove my password. I don't want a password anymore. I will sign in through Authenticator. You can send a one-time passcode to my email. You can do all these other methods. <laughs> don't, don't even accept a password. And that's where we're going, right? That's the goal is to get to a point when what we just talked about last week, Andy, you know, about MD5 cracking and, and, and hash cracking. Wouldn't it be great if we just didn't have hashes in Active Directory at all? And, and they were, or they were garbage, you know, they're 64 character um, before they were hashed, you know, passwords that nobody knows and doesn't use. Like that's the dream. And we don't get there until we deploy these alternatives. So if you've been sitting on the sidelines on Windows Hello, because again, some of those deployment challenges, we've got news. Uh, it's easier than ever. And we highly recommend you take a look. And that's our show for this week. Thanks as always for watching and listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or have topics you guys want us to talk about. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.